start by talking first about the, the relationship that we have, that UVM has with our community, Burlington. Um, so as we think, and again, I want to be focusing on commitments, but there are a lot of informal commitments that then become formal. So in, in looking at um, what happened over the past 10 years with, with UVM expanding from about 4 million square feet to 5 million square feet, and, um, and also addressing some of the, beginning to talk, to, to address some of the commitments with the city about housing, and we've made long-term commitments to provide student housing. We also made a commitment to a lead policy, starting with silver and then moving um, to gold level. Um, all of that happened as a result of a lot of activism beforehand um, on the part of the city in trying to get us to commit to certain things, and part of uh, students and community members to get us to commit to <coughs> the lead um, well, the lead committee, including John Todd, who was having conversations with the president about this and really helped him with that ahead. So those commitments can come from various sources. They're also external commitments, and that's the main thing I want to talk about today. So at UVM, we do have a long history of action with uh, relating to sustainability, and here's some things. A lot of student action. Um, we also encourage that. Steve runs the EcoReps program, which, uh, which is a part of the leadership development continuum at the university, which we like to have our students work with other students and then learn how to be more, even more functional and starting to integrate um, activities into the, the university's well, financial decision-making processes. So I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, one example of student action resulting in a particular commitment with a date is that we are going to end sales of bottled water as defined currently. Um, <laughs> by January of 2015, and it's being phased out right now, and I see the water bottles. Um, so we're, we're expecting that to go, uh, we're going to be able to do that. That's an example of coming from the students, then turning into a, an official commitment. The President's Climate Commitment in 2007 is a commitment coming from the outside, with more than 670 institutions now signed up. UVM was one of the first the first 100, and it's a very serious commitment to annual reporting and getting all your information out there. Um, so it involves um, choosing a day for climate neutrality and then figuring out how to get there, putting it into a plan, um, switching to renewable energy, and buying probably carbon credits and getting involved with the markets to figure out how to compensate. And I, mean, I will add to that is that um, raising the, the President's Climate Commitment um, actually was an impetus for a lot of sustainability programs to even get started. So basically, you had, to, you had to have an office or person to manage it. I mean, and so that's the reason why we had this. So the next one is uh, slide is just saying that out of this, it went from being me um, and how about Stephanie? <laughs> Uh, with uh, Stephanie uh, and a few other people with the Environmental Council doing this in the grassroots level since 96. And now, in, as a result of signing the President's Climate Commitment, the Office of Sustainability really needed to be created or we need to stop talking about this at the University of Vermont. <coughs> so we have a, a structure now that's uh, looking pretty similar to, at least at the, to the reporting level, to quite a few other institutions in higher education. It's just a string of emails um, on the Green School list about how do the Research One institutions manage their sustainability offices, and they seem to almost all have dual reporting, and most of them are to a senior administrator. Um, usually the VP of Finance Administration or equivalent is involved, and that's our, my primary reporting line with a dotted line to the provost. The dots could change depending on who cares about it at a particular time. Another, in here we also have the Clean Energy Fund, which um, have some information here about, but students of all, if anyone who's paid the comprehensive fee has paid into the Clean Energy Fund, that's $10 out of the $955 bucks that they all just shelled out, um, including me. Um, so that generates about $225,000 a year, and it was actually created before the climate commitment, it was part of the impetus for it. So that has created another need to man create a management system. Um, that's a lot of work, and Neko Zeki is the other full-time staff person right here our, in our office, standard projects coordinator, gets to run that along with it, a, a graduate fellow who's paid for out of the, the fund itself. Um, other, then we have three other fellows 
um, Steve is one of them. We keep changing the names, so sorry if the title doesn't quite correspond. Um, Tara Rouse is working with the Sustainability Fat Controls Program, which is mentioned here, to help integrate sustainability into the curriculum. Um, and so, you, and then the Environmental Performance Fellow is the one who has done most of the work for this presentation. And that has been Anna Nika, who is soon to finish her doctorate. Um, and has therefore left employment with the Office of Sustainability to um, be replaced already very successfully by Pooja Kamar, who's, who's um, dived right into, already gotten right into the greenhouse gas inventory. So here's some of the things that we do. I'm not going to go into all of them, because I'm talking about our commitments. And our commitments now um, relate to climate have um, some specific dates. Our climate action says, plan says that we will this top part here is blue part is electricity, our, and this goes back to 1990. So our um, carbon emissions from, or carbon equivalents from electricity, and what we want to see happen is get to zero by 2015. We have committed to that. We have committed to getting to zero from the thermal side by 2020, and to zero on everything else that is currently agree defined, which includes air travel, commuting, and some other things. So, this guarantees me an interesting job for the next year. <laughs> 10 years and, um, and need a lot of help, especially in thinking through how we're going to actually do this when it comes to spending money. Um, so about spending money, we have been spending money with that Clean Energy Fund to uh, stimulate ideas, to stimulate thinking about clean energy. Demonstration projects, um, you can go onto the website and see and again, there's some cards here. Um, you can also submit ideas uh, about what you'd like to see on campus. And those can be related to installations, to uh, lecture series, to demonstration projects, events. What else, what else am I missing? Uh, research courses. projects. Yeah. Courses. Course development. I mean, we'll get in a little trouble about the course development, but supporting some related courses. Stimulating work. ideas for courses. Yes. yes. Um, and there's a committee. We have a member here also who has joined us for the committee of students are in the majority of four undergraduate students, uh, two graduate students, and then five other people who have some responsibility probably for implementing it. And the committee makes recommendations to the VP of Finance and Administration about what to, which projects to develop um, after consulting with a lot of people and also sustainability has a certain filtration that component of that. And um, so some of the projects are listed here. Again, the this even though it's $225,000 a year, that's not going to fix the problem at all. Um, it's more to get us thinking about it. Our annual electric bill is $8 million. And um, just putting the solar panels on the equine center recently, which will take care of 8.5% of the farm's needs, a very good project, is about $134,000 worth of expense. So you can see we're not going to get there quickly through this fund. But it is, that a, is that a clean energy fund project? Yes, it's a clean energy fund project. the entire thing? We funded, we actually were very fortunate. We, we just funded um, a portion of, of it, and then we were luckily through the vendor was able to get take advantage of the Vermont Clean Energy um, yeah. Yeah. Development, development Fund. fund. There was an enormous uh, rebate, but it was a $55,000 grant from the, from, from the Small Scale Renewable Energy Fund, and um, final system cost was $80,000. That. Well, no, we paid eighty thousand, and yeah. then we got about fifty-five thousand dollars of overdates. Cool. So it's good, and it gets us thinking, and it also gets us thinking about how much we can get on campus. There's the, uh, the project that's you know, now near completion is the Comprehensive Campus Renewable Energy Feasibility Study, and that involves interns and lots of work on the Echo's part, but hiring a, a company to look and see where all the different places on campus, the best places to put renewable energy systems on campus using current technology and thinking. So that's going to help guide future decisions by the committee. And also help as, as new construction projects are underway to be able to say, why not consider this right from the outset integrated into the construction project. Energy efficiency needs really a minimum of a million dollars to even be keeping up with 
technology, obvious low payback technology. So, so on that note, uh, because because of the lack of funding for energy efficiency, since our bonding capacity is pretty much dried up at the university, we used, in the past ten years we've used up a lot of debt capacity building on these new buildings, um, and the that didn't make the $250 million deferred maintenance problem go away at all. So the, I just added new things that will soon become deferred maintenance. <laughs> There's a nice story in the free press about this recently, and you can read all about it. Um, but there definitely, but the university has been investing in energy efficiency since 1990 um, with various different ways, some of them more explicit than others, different ways of going about it. Started with a revolving loan fund of a couple hundred thousand dollars in 1992, and that's been ticking along and nobody really noticing it. it does its job with very quick paybacks. And then um, the bonds were paying for major upgrades. There were millions and millions of dollars of upgrades in the last decade, um, and digging up campus to replace steam lines, which allowed all those buildings to be added with no additional steam capacity or volume of fuel. Mm -hmm. So they added 20% more buildings than didn't, almost 20%, and really didn't add more fuel. A couple buildings weren't on the central plant, so it's a little different. But that, that was a lot of money that was invested. And then the money was gone, so UVM recently um, joined with a national, signed up to join this national commitment to the Stable and Endowments Institute, the billion dollar green challenge to put money aside for energy efficiency. and. The, we, at the time of this announcement, which was in April of this year, the, it was the largest commitment under that program to date, um, surpassing Harvard by a million. Um, but other institutions have already been doing it for, for quite a while, just haven't joined this. So this is being able to do the accounting and get the, the main thing is being able to get the money. I mean, you could do these projects, but the hardest thing at the university seems to be to figure out how to get the money back and put it into the account again. So this was a commitment on the part of the Vice President of Finance Administration to make people track the money and put it back in the account and have it all not only do that, but he set some very ambitious goals for us, which um, we are now struggling with, to have um, a 5% return on that investment and a seven year or less payback, even though we really know that we should be doing 10 or 15 year paybacks and why do we have to do a 5% return when the market's only 2%? But the point is that there's still so much efficiency out there that wants to, to show that. Um, and continue, even with it, even after doing this for 20 years, there's still that much opportunity. Chunks of money come in in the, in the fall and the spring, and uh, it would, everyone pays the tuition, and the lowest balance is $130 million. And any given, that's the lowest you ever have. Um, and so this is 10% of the, the lowest balance. So it's really not that much of a gamble, and it's cash. Plus, it's not all going to get spent at, month, at once. The main thing is trying to figure out how to talk about it, actually. So can I ask a question about it? Yes. Does that mean that $13 million are out the door at any one time? No. And when something pays back, then you can invest in something else? I don't understand what the... Well, yeah, that's kind of the idea, but you don't take the whole $13 million. It's going to be a million dollars for an LED lighting upgrade around campus. Mm -hmm. and we haven't really defined all the projects, but that's probably going to be one of them. Um, one of those buildings over there needs infinite amounts of money. I'm going to take first of 18 chunks of a project um, on that one. There's also <coughs> another ugly building over there that has problems. And, and so when you when it gets paid back and it's five to seven years, that money is freed up to invest again. Yes. That's and what so it trickles calling. back in. I mean, what they're going to do is is allocate you know monthly payback. Yeah. Um, ch take it out of the, the utility funds, mm -hmm. which are you know have these huge fluctuations anyway, depending yeah. on the weather and the gas prices and yeah. uh, uh, buildings coming on and off. Or so the trick is to account for the savings over time and credit yourself yes. back yes. the savings. Yes, and so it's this one little tiny path of accounting when there's all this other stuff going on. It's yeah. kind of interesting. I'm trying to run the boat through that ocean. Yeah. So this is the, the commitment on the the part of VP of Finance to try to track it. The other alternative is, is um, to hire an outside company which makes estimate uh, about this and then charges you what you, the, you know, they estimate what you're going to get back and you don't really account for it and you just pay money to them. And you don't learn anything. And, but they have, they provide all of the, the capital and they, just, they make it all good. You 
don't really have, you don't get any control over it. So that's that's the problem is for places that don't have the expertise or the commitment long term, the capital or the you know the ability to, to go find some money. Um, and there's lots of possible job opportunities for our graduates doing things like that. But here we want to try to do it in house and also consult with with people about the the ethics of the whole thing um, as well as the accounting. We have committed in our climate action plan to reporting on our on some of our goals using STARS, Sustainability Tracking and Assessment, Assessment and Rating System, which is um, hosted by ASHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. And it's a voluntary program that uh, covers these three areas of education, operations, and administration, and uh, awarding points for sustainable practices, um, with 100 points for each section, so a total of 300, and it's rather like LEED with bronze, silver, gold certification levels. Um, platinum too, nobody's got platinum yet, but quite a few got gold. 270 institutions have, are, have signed up, and we haven't, but we're tracking the numbers internally for, for these two sections, and someday we'll grade education. Mm. Not quite yet. So but that that has a lot of ways of reporting on sustainability. This whole system has a lot of ways of reporting on sustainability, um, and so there's lots. Of, all of our formal activities and our programs and initiatives, they can all kind of fit into some sort of category on there. Almost all of them. Um, so we've cataloged this, and we'll continue to do this analysis. Uh, here's where it looks on the operations side. If you take all the hundred credits and give them each the pie um, slice the, the number that corresponds to the number of credits for each section. Um, where there's color, that indicates that we think we would get the points. Um, and for a total of almost 39 out of 100. I mean, they're mostly, but with a lot of, so you can see where there isn't color, there's opportunity. And the first opportunity there is energy and climate, because they have pretty aggressive goals in here to reduce. It's also a lot of reduction below 2005 levels, and we've reduced since 1990, so we don't, you know, how that works. You don't get points for not being bad to begin with. You get points mm -hmm. for cleaning up your act. So it isn't absolute, but it gives you a way to track your progress and to see how you look to the outside. Um, so we're tracking that on our website, and Pooja gets to keep doing that. And the Environmental Studies 187 class in the spring will probably continue to, uh, the Campus Sustainability class will continue to be involved. Another um, recent commitment, the, the 2012 commitment, which is a, a pretty big deal, is that UVM became the fifth school in the nation to sign the Real Food Campus Commitment to commit to <coughs> real food um, by 2020. And we think we're at about 11% now, according to a very complicated cal uh, calculator that has been run for a few years by a sustainability intern employed by University Dining Services. So there are different ways to um, think about that too. You could, if we were to define local as being within 500 miles and anything that anybody um, either grows or produces or labels, then we could be there right now. Um, if we decide that local means Vermont's definition, which is draw a picture of Vermont and then draw a little 30 mile donut around it, and that's it. So not even near peaches, folks. Um, <laughs> So this, so those are the sorts of conversations that are going on, and there's a new committee which has students, a student co-chair and a faculty co-chair, um, discussing that. We also have reporting, like three, six, nine month, twelve month reporting with a certain requirement to do something. So these are those kinds of the way that commitments have been evolving. Um, we've so you've seen related to commitment related to climate, climate commitment related to energy efficiency with the green billion dollar challenge, um, the real food challenge, and then the bottled water one is also um, something that is getting a lot more. <coughs> campuses are responding one way or another. Not too many are making the commitment to end sales entirely. When they make a commitment to end sales, well, what they really mean is in the resident dining halls. Mm. And that's where we don't even sell it to begin with. So it's an interesting conversation. So what I would like to do, if you are up for it, would be is to focus on the climate action plan because I would appreciate some help. Uh, if you don't want to talk about that, that's fine too. Here's what I had in mind. 
Um, here's their plan, and we need to get deal with electricity first. I've been part of a lot of interesting conversations about electricity. And some questions that come up for me um, have to do with the role that we should, the university might be playing in um, with renewable, renewable energy development. What kinds of roles? We've, some of the Clean Energy Fund has some of those roles, but how about in the marketplace? Um, and what does sustainable local renewable energy mean to us at UVM? The goal that, as I've put it, uh, I've tried to articulate it with the Climate Action Plan, is it does say carbon neutrality for carbon neutral electricity by 2015, but what I've been meaning by that is local renewable energy, which may not be climate neutral at all. So we might have to also buy carbon offsets to make that be true. Um, wood, for example, is considered by some, biomass considered by some to be carbon neutral, but by other people who think that combustion usually results in carbon pollution to um, not be carbon neutral. And then another question is uh, how and how soon should we be defining uh, acceptable carbon offsets in the one way to meet this goal is just to define things differently. <laughs> um, another thing, another question about that is, this might be really hard to get to thermal, not carbon neutrality on the thermal side. I mean, if even if we weasel out of it on the, or something, you know, get to it on the electricity <laughs> side. Um, what happens on the thermal side? We're not going to be able to do that. Even if we switch to biomass from the McNeil plant, which has been the dream for the past 30 years, by then their uh, biomass definitely won't be considered carbon neutral, I think. So that seems like it's going that direction. So how do we talk about that? And do we just talk about it in classes? Or should we do something like require um, study abroad to be carbon neutral and then pay the consequences of that, you know, mm -hmm. make it happen and do something unpleasant? in the short term. So those were some questions I'd be interested in discussing. Um, any other things that people would like to talk about? Yes. So. so have you guys ever considered running a cap and trade scheme inside UVM? So get all the units, get their baselines for heating and electricity, nope. calculate how much money it would cost you to offset that, nope. put that money on the table for every unit. And if they get under it, they get money. And if they get under it and someone else is over theirs, they can trade for money. Hmm. I like that idea a lot because it unleashes, I mean, sorry, but lots of competitive ideas, not just a small set of them. And also, it's a really good educational analog for what's happening globally right now, mm -hmm. right? So we can recreate Copenhagen inside UVM and learn firsthand all the things that have made Copenhagen really hard baselines. Russia hit the tank and so it has really low emissions as a baseline. Is that fair? You know, so um, I just, have you ever thought about that? Do you think that would be an interesting way to I think that's a great things? idea. We'll never do that. Because yeah. we can't even figure out how much energy our buildings use. Yeah, Usually. less than one. First we would have to actually decide how to allocate the heat, the heating fuel mm -hmm. cost. Um, that building over there probably uses four times the heat per square foot than those residence halls, but there's no way of measuring that. Or there, there are ways it'd be very expensive measuring that. And if you did, then you have to have a whole accounting system to, to, to figure it out. Um, the idea of having every department pay for its own is interesting. You could that you would really change the competition for space because you could. Right. <laughs> You know, everybody would want to be in the greenest building, we might have to pay a lot to get into that building too. You really should be doing continuous commissioning. So commissioning is making sure that you got what you paid for and the system actually, they actually plug the valves in the right direction um, and the thing runs. Um, and recommissioning is fixing it after everybody, the building, after everyone's, you know, fooled around with it and changed things to put a new lab in. And continuous commissioning is going in every year and making sure the systems are still running. It's, like, the way that we deal with these buildings is um, we, you don't even really need the numbers to figure it out. It's sort of like having a car, and if you never inflate the tire, you never change the oil, and you never deal with fixing the car, you're gonna, obviously your car is not going to work properly. So just it's main, you know, good old maintenance. So you know you could do the whole cap and trade thing, um, or you could just do business the way it should be done. So. 
Um, I just want to go back to renewable energy development. Um, like the the project out there is awesome, but I uh, I wonder why you know just there. It seems like being so many more places. Can the thirteen million dollars uh, just for efficiency, mm -hmm. or is it also for um, energy development? Because only efficiency. The uh, you know ten dollars from every comprehensive fee adds up pretty slowly. Hundred thirty thousand looks pretty big to that fund. When you put it in perspective of the $8 million that the university spends annually on electricity, um, that's 61 of those projects um, without any sort of subsidies. Um, so that, I mean, that's, yeah, that's potentially a game changer. Um, if, that, if some of that real capital is um, freed up to do some of that, and you know, they have very real uh, lots. Um, so, you know, they could produce for the um, general for the, they cover that 5% and you know, probably additional returns on the energy fund. Well, we need to keep looking at possibilities because the, the, because of the Vermont Clean Energy Development Fund having those great rebates, we're able to put a whole lot more solar panels on the, on the um, pipeline center. Um, perhaps because Burlington Electric Department has just decided that, um, one peak demand reduction strategy is that's going to be important this time around. It's going to be solar. We're trying to get what was it two how many megawatts of solar? Can you give I don't know. There's a few megawatts. We have a significant chunk after going through a, a very long and entertaining process of doing integrated resource planning for these three-year plans that the the Volunteer Electric Department has to submit to the Public Service Board. Uh, there are a lot of different strategies you could take, like, okay, natural gas is cheap, let's just go for that, and forget all these wrecks, you know, could have decided that. I decided to instead go with buying wreck, keep retaining or, or, or exchanging wrecks, and, um, and solar as a, as a quite component, so we should be looking at that. But really, what we're, we're going to find is that our campus is very developed, the, it's a, you know, most developed part of Vermont, and, um, we're not going to generate a lot of electricity on this campus. So that, I mean, I think that's what we're going to find. We'll wait for what the study says, but yeah. we're not going to generate a lot of electricity on this campus. There's some pretty nice rooftops out there. Though. Yes, but we're then we're also a study historical. We have, a, we have a lot of buildings that are historical, so that kind of limits it. There are also kind of shading issues. Mm -hmm. We have a whole, and also you want to take advantage, we are in two different electric districts. So we have GMP, and we also have Burlington Electric Department. So where we've optimized and why, why we have a lot of the solar projects out on the farm is because it's in GMP territory and we've been able to take advantage of the, kind of the rebates and everything else from that. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. it's it's kind of, it's all about that, but just the reason why we are not doing installations right now, for right now, is until we get this study, we want to be a little bit more strategic in placement. A lot of these started <laughs> off as students or faculty ideas pointing out going, well, that looks great, and, and, and you know, or looking at rooftops around me, and they're like, that looks great, but we really want to have a strategic way of saying, these are some optimal areas of looking at different technologies that we could, you know, right now, the technology now that might be optimal for here, and so we said, so yeah, we'll find out, it'll be really interesting to see, but if I were to bet, I'm, I would bet, I'd, I'd like to get in trouble, well, I'd be wrong, but I bet it's you no know, more than 5% of our yeah. Yeah. And I think that we could reduce our, we could, through efficiency or just through not doing much stuff we really don't need to be doing, we could probably reduce by way more than 5% and it would be a whole lot cheaper. So just thinking about how much capital, we don't have infinite amounts of capital. Um, to me, the worst thing is an inefficient a building with a solar beanie on top. It's really embarrassing. Yeah. 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 I had a question kind of falling on the renewable energy strategy, and it sounds like the plan on new to UV, I'm not going to use that as a great disclaimer. I don't know anything about the school. But um, the, the plan you guys are doing in profiling locations for solar sounds fantastic, and I completely agree with you that it's probably not going to make a huge dent in terms of the overall. Um, electrical budget of the university. I've been on um, at at other large sites where people have actually used off-site locations to locate wind power, mm -hmm. um, which is incredibly more efficient than <coughs> is that an option for UVM or something that's being discussed? In that you wouldn't be generating power directly for UVM, UVM but you would be perhaps getting yourself towards a, a carbon neutrality. There's a whole continuum of possibilities. One is to Put something on our own land, you know. This 
see if we can get away with putting a big honking wind turbine on top of Mansfield. Probably won't get away with that. Um, but the uh, to making all the way from there all the way to to offsets and just saying, well, somebody else is doing something, or maybe having somebody helping somebody else build that wind, build a wind turbine that feeds in either locally or not. Um, we're making more of the commitment to local energy and. Um, and I'm recommending the approach of working with our utilities and working with our, our community people to see what if, so we can be good members of this this community and you know, do something that's going to be worthwhile. So the first conversation then is with the utilities themselves. What what are you trying to accomplish? How are you trying to account for these things over the next ten years? And um, can we work with you? And then the next, if that doesn't work out, then the next thing is, okay, who else is out there? Mm -hmm. Some institutions have tons of land that they can develop, or they're willing to stick their necks out and put that thing there. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't take much to put up one yeah. big wind turbine that can generate a lot of power. Um, yes, and in Vermont, that would that be like, you might as well just go and throw yourself on the railroad tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Politically, yeah. Politically, you would just go kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That will not happen here. Okay. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so it was even the miracle was that we were even able to have like small reden residential. That took five. Yeah. That took about five but in years. Vermont, no, that will, that is not something we're going to be. We talking about the University of Vermont doing directly because if you look at the newspaper, just you know Google it and you'll see. Too much bad. So why is it so sure. controversial? Because um, recreation and tourism generates most money for the state, and you start putting wind towers on the ridges, so it's been very controversial. Yeah. And they don't have and to go on ridges, though. I mean, yes, they do. They, they have, have to go on there's, it's not, there's not a lot of optimal wind and looking at in, in this part of the area. So. If you want them to be on ridges, you put them on ridges, they not only don't look nice if you think of that, but they also chop up, you know, they chop the this in terms of, of the natural integrity, you just completely chopped it all back. So it's a, that's the, the issue here. And why we um, still have to create power plant running, even though it's really old. So on that note, with a positive thing about nuclear power, <laughs> let's end. Thank you very much for talking about it.